uh, welcome to this lecture number 5 of uh, this groundwater hydrology course. Uh, in this lecture, we are uh, starting with the second chapter that is on occurrence and movement of uh, ground water. And we will uh, and we know that this uh, ground water it so initially it appears in the below the ground and then it moves below the ground also in uh, various uh, locations. So, all these aspects are uh, will be studied in uh, this chapter. So, here so the so first of all we need to need to know where and how this ground water exists. Okay. Next we need to So, the geologic zones which facilitate the storage and or movement of ground water. So, when we are when we need to know where and how ground water exists obviously, we uh, our uh, focus is uh, shifted to the geologic zones or formations which exist below the ground and uh, so not all the the geological zones below the ground uh, are uh, conducive for the occurrence and uh, for ground water. So, only certain selected geological zones uh, facilitate the storage as well as movement of. Uh, so, we need to study them and uh, here. So, the next is. So, the water holding and uh, water yielding properties of these uh, geologic zones or formations. So, and of course, uh, therefore, the uh, here, so we cannot exclude the role of geology from groundwater hydrology. So, as the uh, this groundwater hydrology implies, so the the study of water 
the quantitative the predominantly quantitative study of water below the ground or below the surface and here when we talk of uh, this one the groundwater hydrology so we have to consider the uh, geology also and uh, there are some spec special cases also such as uh, say the so here let me write so geology is an important part of geology has an important role in uh, groundwater hydrology and uh, here so let us also let me mention here springs hydrothermal phenomena hydrothermal phenomena water in uh, permanently frozen ground constitute special groundwater occurrences so these springs may be releasing water either at the normal temperature or they may be releasing water at a higher temperature or a lower temperature due to various hydrothermal phenomena wherein so the uh, the groundwater which is getting released through the springs it is either getting uh, heated or sometimes it is also getting uh, cool down so as well as so there may be some water which is uh, permanently frozen so all these constitute the special cases of uh, the occurrence of ground water now let us come to the origin and uh, age of ground water so here i would like to explain this origin and age of ground water with the help of this uh, diagram consisting of these uh, six blocks so let us start with the the newest among them which is represented at the top and which is denoted as which is known as juvenile water so that is new water and next below that is the magmatic water 
So, this magmatic water of course, also includes uh, plutonic. So, this magmatic water is uh, in or uh, from magma, which is in the deeper strata. And uh, here, and if it is in very deep strata, so then it is known as, so this is plutonic is, so this is a very deep strata. Next is this uh, meteoric water. So, that is atmospheric water. And uh, from this atmospheric water, of course, so there is also, I am sorry, so, so here, so there is also, so this uh, from magmatic water there is a connection to oceanic water, which is the water in the ocean. And uh, here, there is a two way link between oceanic water and uh, meteoric water, which is essentially the atmospheric water, which is you can say it is recent water. Then, there is also another two way link between oceanic water and the, this uh, conate, so which is uh, also known as uh, fossil water, conate water. And uh, here there is uh, another uh, this one, which is uh, metamorphic water. Is the water which exists in the metamorphic rocks or rocks undergoing a change in it their form. Again from this metamorphic water to conate water, there is a two way flow and also, so here say from this uh, metamorphic water and uh, magmatic water, there is a two way interaction. So, this is uh, this figure is taken from the geologic Geological Society of of America in 1957. So, essentially here we have say six types of water depending upon their uh, occurrence as well as age. And uh, here as you can see, so this juvenile water as well as this meteoric water. So, they are the most recent ones, this is atmospheric water, meteoric water also means and uh, this conate water which is the oldest one, conate water and also you can say this plutonic water which is existing in the deep, uh, deeper strata. So, and uh, in between, so there is magmatic water, there is metamorphic water and also this oceanic water and of course, oceanic water, it is a mixture of uh, all because the ocean water right at the top. So, it must have, uh, it might have been uh, at the ocean surface, maybe it could be very recent, whereas the ocean water at deeper depths, it could be almost as old as uh, say conate water 
or uh, say the plutonic motor and so on. So, essentially what I am trying to tell you is the, uh, the, the age of ground water depends upon the various factors, the location from where it has uh, come as well as the depth of this, uh, uh, the, uh, the depth below the ground where this ground water is existing. Okay. So, now, so essentially as I was mentioning, so there are uh, these six forms of water and it is this, uh, there is a two way interaction between magmatic water and metamorphic water. There is also a two way interaction between conate water and metamorphic water. Uh, is, uh, there is another two way interaction between conate water and oceanic water. There is one more two way interaction between oceanic water and meteoric or atmospheric water. So, essentially, so this ocean water is in two way interaction with uh, meteoric or atmospheric water as well as conate water and metamorphic water is in two way interaction with uh, conate water as well as magmatic water and this mag metamor magmatic as well as conate water they have two way interaction with only this, uh, ma this conate water has two way interaction with oceanic water as well as metamorphic water whereas this uh, magmatic water it has two way interaction uh, two way interaction with only metamorphic water so now let us come to the the age determination age of uh, ground water so here in this while determining the age so it is the isotope hydrology helps in ground water age determination. And when I talk of isotopes, so two important isotopes are there that is uh, tritium which is uh, H3 that is hydrogen 3 so essentially hydrogen with uh, two proton additional proton molecules proton uh, particles and then there is carbon 14 and this tritium 3 it has a half life period. So, these are the two isotopes, both these are uh, isotopes. So, this has a half life period of uh, 12.3 years and this carbon 14, it has a half life period. of uh, 5730 years. So, here, so because, so the half life period in case of tritium is uh, relatively small, while that for uh, carbon 14 is relatively large. So, these two are uh, used in determining the age of the ground water in uh, uh, various uh, geological formations and here so this uh, so 
So, this uh, this tritium is used for estimating ground water residence times up to say 50 years. And this C 14 that is the carbon 14 used to are used for estimating ground water residence times from uh, several hundred years to 50,000 years. And uh, here we should also remember that the equation which is A is equal to A 0 into e to the power minus gamma t, where A is the, uh, the radioactivity at uh, time t, the observed radioactivity and A 0 is the radioactivity when the ground water enters the when the water enters the aquifer and this uh, lambda is the decay constant and T is the time uh, and generally it is the time is measured in years. Okay. So, with this uh, and uh, it is also mentioned here that this uh, the carbon 14 isotope is present in ground water as a dissolved bicarbonate originating from uh, biologically active layers of soil, where uh, carbon dioxide is generated. So, basically wherever this uh, dissolve, there is a dissolved bicarbonate which generates carbon dioxide by root respiration and uh, humus decay. So, there so, this carbon 14, the this isotope generally exists. And uh, so, these two isotopes, these uh, mainly these two isotopes that is tritium which is hydrogen 3 as well as carbon 14. So, they have been used to determine the age of uh, uh, this ground water samples all the way up to say 20,000 to 30,000 years in the Middle East such as the uh, United Arab Republic which is uh, basically the uh, Russia, no, I am sorry Egypt, uh, it was uh, Egypt, uh, uh, it was uh, previously known as Egypt along with uh, I believe uh, say another uh, North African country. So, they were together known as uh, United Arab Republic. So, essentially in uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So, these uh, two isotopes have been used to uh, determine the ground water samples having a ages uh, of uh, say 20,000 to 30,000 years. So, now let us come to the next part of uh, the next article which is the the rock properties which affect the ground water. And here, so when we talk of these rock properties, so rock or soil properties,
implies those properties which facilitate the storage and movement of uh, ground water. And uh, here, so before going for this rock properties, we should uh, know certain terminologies such as uh, aquifer and uh, so this aquifer it has the synonyms that is the ground water reservoir or so this is or with an underline that means one and the same it is a synonym so it is a water bearing formation So basically, so this aquifer, it is uh, this uh, soil or rock formation or layer, wherein, so there is enough of uh, void spaces for the groundwater to get stored as well as to move. And uh, here, so because the of the capability of uh, 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 storage as well as uh, movement of ground water within the aquifer. So, these aquifers, so they are basically they yield significant amount of ground water. to springs and wells for the simple reason that so there are uh, lots of empty or void spaces when in which the ground water gets stored and uh, because of the the hydraulic gradient so this ground water also starts moving from a higher gradient to from a higher head to lower head wherever there is a slope or a gradient. So, the ground water starts moving and eventually, so these aquifers yield significant amount of ground water uh, to various uh, wells which may be open wells or tube wells or uh, even to springs where uh, say many uh, small streams and uh, other uh, uh, these uh, water bodies. So, they originate or okay. and uh, these aquifers generally have a confining bed. Say, so, suppose this is an aquifer, it is uh, so let me represent uh, this as a so this is an aquifer. So, these represent the void spaces in them, and then so here. So, they may have either a fully confining bed or they may have a semi confining bed. So, this could be fully confining bed and then so this could be Here you can say impervious. And this is a semi pervious confining bed. So, when it is semi pervious, so then this uh, ground water leaks through this uh, 
semi pervious confining layer. So, this is the so this is the ground water leakage you can see and uh, so now let us also know little bit about three more terminologies that is aquifuge, aquitard and then aquiclude. So, here aquiclude Equitard Equifuge. So, here let us understand the meaning of this. So, we can remember this as aqua exclude. So, water is excluded from movement that is equiclude. So, basically here, so this is an impervious material practically not yielding ground water. So, example for equiclude is uh, say clay. So, clay is a soil with the finest particle size. So, therefore, the amount of uh, void spaces is uh, very limited. So, therefore, this clay behaves like an aquiclude. Next it is the aquitard which is a saturated but uh, less permeable stratum which retards ground water movement. And here the examples for this equitard is uh, a sandy clay. Well, the example for aquiclude is a clay. So, because clay is consists of fine, finest soil particles with uh, practically no void spaces or empty spaces. On the other hand, the sandy clay, it will have some empty spaces through which, so the there is a less permeability and so it is uh, saturated also. So, therefore, it retards, so it yields very limited quantities of uh, ground water. Next is this equifuge. So, this is a relatively impermeable formation not containing 
and not transmitting water that is an aquifuge. So, here we can give an example of a hard rock such as uh, granite. other hard rock ok. So, they form aquifuge. So, now we uh, learnt about aquifer which is basically a water bearing strata which can be interpreted as a ground water reservoir and also followed by this equitard which is uh, essentially which retards the ground water movement. Then it is the equiclude which is practically an impervious material not yielding ground water such as clay and lastly equifuge which is a hard rock. So, this clay will contain water, this uh, equiclude will contain water, but this aquifuge does not contain and it does not transmit also water ok. So, these are the four uh, uh, the soil or rock formations and out of this for our case the aquifer is the most important in case of ground water hydrology as well as this aquitard. So, this is we have to exploit we have to harness ground water using the aquifers and we should uh, so and, uh, ensure that. So, these aquifers should have a proper uh, confining layer either at the bottom or uh, in the sides. So, that so this ground water is uh, stored and it is not leaked to so undesirable locations. Now, the most important property of the rock or soil is known as uh, porosity and this porosity, so if you denote it as alpha, then this is a volume of interstices divided by the total volume. Okay, since uh, just to distinguish this from velocity, I am using the, the V hatch notation. So, this V i is the volume of voids, interstices that is voids and this V is the the total volume of soil or rock. So, this porosity it ranges from say 0 to 50 percent and uh, in case of say this equifuge so, the porosity will be 0 percent and in case of equiclude the porosity will be very low and then in case of equitard the porosity will be even more and uh, aquifer will have the highest porosity. So, here so this porosity can also be expressed as 1 minus rho d divided by rho m. So, this rho d is the mineral particle density or grain density
and this rho m I am sorry, so this is a, so this rho m is the mineral particle density and this uh, rho d, so this is the bulk density. So, this porosity can also be expressed as 1 minus the bulk density divided by the grain density. So, this mineral particle density also known as uh, grain density. And depending upon whether these void spaces are primary or secondary, so there can be we can also define this primary porosity and uh, secondary porosity. Now, let us come to this uh, the ground water column. So, in this we discuss about the ground water which exists at various depths right from the ground below. So, here so there is a very important interface and that interface is known as the water table it is also known as so in case of uh, piezometric surface or uh, say phreatic surface essentially Suppose this is the ground and the water table is denoted by W t. It represents that layer, that horizontal layer below the ground, below which the entire soil or rock layer is uh, saturated and above which the soil or rock layer is either partially saturated or unsaturated. So, that is the water surface and here, so accordingly, so this uh, whole thing is known as a ground water column. So, suppose I represent this as a column, then the the soil column above water table is known as a zone of aeration and there is other name also and the water present in this is known as uh, Vedo's water, water which may be present many times if it is uh, fully dry, if it is fully unsaturated then there may not be any this one at all. And the, the soil or rock column below the water table, so this is known as zone of saturation. and the water which is available there is known as the ground water. And again this uh, 
zone of aeration. So, it has three zones the top one is known as the, the soil water zone so this corresponding to so here this uh, corresponds to root zone depth and uh, the the bottom one is known as uh, capillary zone or it is also known as capillary fringe wherein even though it is above the water table in the zone of aeration due to capillary action taking place through the thin this, uh, capillary tubes as well as uh, slots so, some water rises up to the uh, this capillary is up to the top of this capillary zone uh, by the action of capillarity due to surface tension of water. And in between the soil water zone and the capillary zone, so there is what is known as the intermediate Weddow zone. So, this intermediate Weddow zone is below the, the soil water zone, wherein we will find the, the root depths of plants and it is above the capillary zone uh, to the top of which we will find the, the capillary uh, rise of water. So, essentially this soil water zone, intermediate zone and Weddell zone, I am sorry capillary zone together constitute what is known as the zone of aeration which is above the water table. And uh, here, so this uh, zone of saturation the, at the bottom of this zone of saturation we have impermeable layer and again so this zone of saturation may contain few impermeable layers few impermeable or semi permeable layers uh, within them and uh, so accordingly it may contain say one or more uh, aquifers so here the aquifer which is just below the water table is known as the unconfined aquifer or the water table aquifer and the aquifer which is uh, bound at the top as well as bottom by this confining layers it is known as the confined aquifer and uh, here let me also represent how the water is held in this uh, Weddow zone. Suppose, say these are the soil particles, these are the soil or uh, a rock. soil or a rock and then so this is a soil or a rock particles and uh, in between say this is the air particle and here due to the attraction between water and the soil or rock particles. So, this uh, this water, so this is 
Vedo's water. So, which is held between the soil uh, rock particles as well as uh, the air particle. So, like this, so in the unsaturated zone, so there may be Vedo's water if it is a, uh, it is a in the unsaturated or partially saturated zone. And uh, coming to this, uh, this capillary zone, so here obviously the, uh, the height of this capillary zone, so depends upon the capillary rise if this is H and it is given by 2 sigma cos theta divided by R gamma. So, the sigma is the surface tension of water and theta is the angle of contact. and R is the, so the radius of capillary tube and this gamma is the, the specific weight of water. So, based on these four parameters that is the surface tension which is measured as force per unit length and then this uh, theta the angle of contact. So, R the radius of the capillary tube and uh, if it is a slot in that case it is the, the semi width of the slot as well as the specific weight of water. So, based on this the capillary rise the height of the capillary rise can be determined which determines the depth of the capillary capillary zone or capillary fringe. So, we will uh, stop here and then we will continue about uh, further uh, in this uh, on this the various uh, zones that is zone of aeration, zone of saturation. Thank you.